el día de hoy en charlas de economía estamos con Marina Cola. Marina es eh, directora asistente de la sección de Health Informatics del Centro para Data Science Espacial de la Universidad de Chicago. Eh, Marina es una eh, geógrafa en salud, health geographer, y uno de sus, eh, una de sus áreas más fuertes de análisis ha sido la, los análisis de DIF en DIF espacial, eh, teniendo en cuenta elementos, eh, violaciones de los supuestos normales que nosotros tenemos. Marina, thank you for being here and I'll let you go. Let you start. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak and apologies for um, uh, solamente uh, hablo un poquito de español. <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to, to do the talk um, in my, my, I guess, my second language. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll just start right off. Okay. Let's see here. And I can share the slides as well afterwards, a link to the slides for anyone who needs it. But um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about distilling the effect of the 2008 recession on food access in a segregated city, um, implementing a spatial quasi-experimental approach. And when I was writing this, that was the that was the last recession, but obviously there's a new recession <laughs> happening. So um, it, yeah. But when I speak to the recession, it's the, the last one. Before I dive into the topic, um, I thought because of um, conversations I've had <laughs> um, with one in about uh, causal inference and spatial analysis that I could give a little bit of a background of some of the methodological approaches um, because this analysis is really meant to, it's, it was done in a counterfactual framework of causal inference. And when we're doing causal inference, um, there's a really strong focus on the sutva assumption by Rubin. So this is the stable unit treatment value assumption um, that is, again, assumed throughout causal um, inference that requires that outcomes be independent of actual treatment assignment at both individual and population levels. Um, so extending that, the two core assumptions of this are that the potential outcomes for any one unit do not vary with treatment assigned to others. And then also that for each unit, there's no different form or versions of each treatment level that would lead to a different outcome. Um, my, my whole kind of goal and motive here is to really demonstrate how spatial effects can violate um, components of the sutva assumption that make traditional kind of causal inference very difficult um, for some uh, kind of policy evaluation at larger levels. And therefore we need to better incorporate um, models, methods, techniques um, that have a spatial uh, focus. So what are some, you know, uh, kind of ish common issues of sutra violations? So again, sutra requires the outcomes to be independent of actual treatment assignment at both the indi indi individual and population level. However, many observational studies or kind of, um, you know, uh, quasi experiments done in causal inference will use geographic units. Um, like uh, in, in, in the US census tracts or, um, you know, it could be counties, uh, states, that sort of thing. So these geographic units are not permanent geographic barriers, people can move between geographic units and that movement and mobility and interaction, but thus kind of in some cases can pose um, challenges. So on the left hand side, you see a, a dot density map of Chicago. Um, essentially each of these um, dots uh, are different uh, racial ethnic uh, groups. So these pink dots correspond to white, uh, these blue dots correspond to black, uh, the orange, uh, Hispanic, uh, and then we have a small Asian enclave uh, of, uh, in Chicago. The core message here is that you can see there's a very strong imprint of segregation that exists in Chicago um, with very distinct uh, spatial patterns. Um, and of course, this makes kind of traditional causal inference um, uh, difficult. So there's a lot of different Again, 
usually there's an assumption of independence between units, but more near things or more similar. Um, and then, or things that are closer will be more similar than things that are far away. So for example, if you're comparing two uh, neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago and they're right next to each other, they're going to be more similar than comparing a community area on the north side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago. And that, um, that the fact that that exists makes, again, um, treating each of these areas is independent um, objects. You know, your IID assumption is essentially not there. So common approaches to deal with this, um, especially in um, some econometric work, is to aggregate up, right? So aggregate all your areas up so that way that um, the areas, there's, there is a more um, exchangeable population, but sometimes we're interested in phenomena that are at lower spatial resolution. So if we're actually interested in something that's happening at a finer scale, aggregating up is going to miss that effect. And then um, depending on what tradition you're in, um, this, uh, uh, so for example, Charles Mansky calls aspects of this the reflection problem um, in geography. Uh, we'll refer to this as the modified area unit problem. Um, there's kind of a spin on the ecological fallacy. So there's this, this, this issue of uh, different uh, patterns occurring at different scales exists throughout uh, multiple uh, academic traditions. Um, here I have just kind of a really simple chart of that, that distills different types of spatial effects. Oftentimes when spatial effects are considered um, or not, usually when they're not considered, it's just assumed that it's, you know, um, there's just one type of spatial effect. But in fact, there are many different types of spatial effects and each spatial effects, each spatial effect can uh, uh, be approximated by a different phenomenon, right? So for example, upgrading cancer screening in one area um, can influence neighboring areas, right? Um, tax, uh, tax breaks in one state um, may influence behavior at the border between that state and a different state for something like cigarette tax, right? Um, so that kind of behavior we would call a spatial lag or spatial spillover, but that's going to be different from other types of spatial effects. For example, when you're mismatching spatial units uh, or the spatial um, scales, or um, another example would be um, maybe you have a cluster of uh, older homes in a city that have increased lead levels, right? So that is not going to influence neighboring areas like in the spatial spillover example, but um, that's because there's a different history behind that, right? So um, this is an example of Actually, both of these examples you could also find in Chicago. So this is a different um, data generating process um, and a different type of spatial effect. So one of the goals of using spatial um, extensions is essentially to start to tease apart the different approaches here. So um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just stop that here um, before, and dive right into the, the main um, kind of uh, talk. Um, but I thought that kind of providing this more structural uh, background for how I'm thinking about the methods could be helpful. Um, so really the, the core question from a methods perspective is, you know, how can we use existing data, um, even if it's imprecise, incomplete, um, and, and, and whatnot, uh, to evaluate programs or policies in a scalable, uh, confirmatory way where spatial effects are present. Um, so rather than not doing it, there, there probably are things that we can do that start to approximate that. So that's what this talk is about um, with one, one case study. Um, so this talk um, uh, or this subject is around food insecurity. Um, uh, specifically, it'll be in Chicago, but first just talking about food insecurity um, in the United States and how it increased during um, the, the Great Recession in 2008. So food security is linked to low income households who will experience multiple barriers to accessing affordable nutrient dense foods. Um, so these barriers could be uh, distance to nearest uh, fresh you know, fruit market where very low income areas may not have many uh, grocery stores available to them, but they could also be barriers like, um, again, uh, cost of food, uh, transportation, 
uh, and that sort of thing. So an important feature of food security further is continued access to healthy foods. So having access to a great grocery store one year, but then it closing down a few years later is obviously um, not ideal. Um, so one year into the Great Recession of 2008, two out of 10 children were estimated to be food insecure in the United States. Um, and there was an increased enrollment in subsidized food and lunch programs nationwide. Um, that being said, the, rec the recession impacted different regions differently. Um, so overall, food insecurity prevalence seemed to be greatest in suburban areas between, again, like the urban and rural areas uh, during the recession, but it really depended on where you were looking at in the U.S. Um, Midwestern cities, where kind of Chicago is concentrated, um, tended to experience greater food insecurity than the non-metro areas. So that was interesting where in some places the cities had the worst access um, than um, other areas, but it, it, it really varied by, by region. In Chicago specifically, re uh, the recession had differential impacts by neighborhood type with low income and minority or minoritized geographies often the hardest hit. Um, so the specific impact, however, of the recession on food insecurity um, is unclear. Um, and why Chicago? So Chicago is really the nexus of food access research um, in the US. Um, it's the third largest city in the US with 2.7 million. It's also one of the most racially and segregated by economic um, status. Uh, so in 2006, a consultant uh, developed a private, it was a privately funded food desert report in 2006 where the term food desert was uh, branded as kind of a new um, field of inquiry that businesses could get subsidies for in the future, essentially. Um, research from 2004 to the present um, really highlight a lot of food inequity in in the area so chicago has come up a lot in the food desert literature um, and uh, after 2010 local state national programs um, were emerging to incentivize again gr grocery retail development in underserved communities and that's the kind of subsidy programs that i was just talking about um, so what about the impact of the recession on food access in Chicago, right? Like where is the intersection between these two things? Um, so there's a few research gaps in this area. Um, there's a growing need to examine localized small area effects of the recession. So because grocery store access is happening at a very local scale, it's not happening at a, you know, someone's not going to travel to the other side of the city. Um, or that is going to have a much greater, um, you know, cost to them uh, than traveling just a few blocks away. Um, so there's a need for small area um, analysis here. Uh, also, you know, how does the food retail landscape respond to macro shocks? And then what groups are the most vulnerable to these shocks? So in a previous study um, with some colleagues, we had done a longitudinal exploration of food access in Chicago from 2007 to 2014, um, looking at three cross sections and found that access slightly worsened for some groups, not all groups, but for some groups between 2007 and 2011 before improving. Um, so uh, to take advantage of this as a natural experiment, um, and here the experiment being the impact of this, you know, macro shock on the, on, on the, the landscape, um, I implemented a quasi-experimental research design to quantify the impact of the Great Recession on the foodscape. So how <laughs> to come about this. First, I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the previous study and kind of what justified this as a natural experiment. Um, so again, we had looked at changes in Chicago food access um, from 2007 to 2014. Um, and one of the findings of that was that while average distance to supermarkets for Chicago census tracts increased as a whole, so overall supermarket access got better um, between those two years, the relationship of high and low access pretty much remained the same. So even though it got better for everybody, areas that already had a lot of supermarkets got just about as many new supermarkets as other areas did. Um, overall, between 2007 and 2014. 
Um, and if we look at that a little bit further and try to characterize, like, what are areas that persistently had the best access? Um, and um, this is 0.65 miles. Um, you'll have to quickly Google what the <laughs> translation that is in kilometers. It's pretty, it's a pretty, it's a 10 minute walk. Um, so areas with persistent were about 1.6 million persons, predominantly white, um, very uh, few children in poverty, about half families, uh, a relatively high median income of almost 60,000, and high population density. So this is, again, a, pop a dense, um, relatively uh, well-to-do population. In contrast, we have persistently low, uh, regions of persistently low access um, with just about half a million people, and um, the average uh, distance to near a supermarket was 1.28 miles. So that's probably at least two kilometers or more. So, um, so yeah, so that's, so it's, it's, and in the U.S., like the standard for what's considered good access in an urban environment is one mile. So about 1.6 kilometers. Um, so these areas were disproportionately um, black residents, very high, almost half the children um, in these areas uh, in poverty. Interestingly, many, many more families. Um, and, and I think this is important because again, characterizing areas of, or like underserved areas, it's not just about, um, again, like a race ethnicity, like there's, um, there's families, these are families in poverty, right? Um, a median income that's, that's half essentially of the other group and then low population density. And here, population density matters because this is a this is a challenge that's often found in rural areas, where you have people but distributed across a wide geographic region, um, with uh, lower income in um, underserved communities. And so it's just, you know, geographically more difficult to solve. You can't just put one supermarket in a in a high dense spot. Um, so so this is kind of a double challenge. And here is just kind of a quick view of, um, so if we look at all black minority census tracts, that's in blue here, and then the black majority census tracts in pink. Um, first, you can see how, again, segregated Chicago is. We have this west side um, and the south side here, um, and then the other areas are blue. Um, so here, this blue area corresponds to this line down here, where we can see persistently excellent access. So this is distance uh, or potential food access. So distance to nearest um, uh, supermarket. Um, and you can see that it's already pretty good. It's already at, you know, below 0.8 miles to the nearest and it just get, gets better over time. So that's pretty, um, pretty dramatic. In contrast, you have another group up here, this pink group where we start with already bad access. So over one mile, it gets worse and then it starts to get better. Okay, um, so here again, black majority and minority groups both improved by 2014, meaning they had to travel less distance to get to a supermarket, while these inequities overall persisted throughout time periods. When breaking down our results across each section, we can see that um, for the black majority group, again, it's slightly worsened in 2011. And again, here, what happened between these two time periods between 2011 and 2007? The recession. So that's really what the, the, the hypothesis that's being tested here. Was there an impact of the recession on food access at the track level in Chicago? Or were these cross-sectional findings just noise? Um, so the research design um, approach here is a spatially extended counterfactual framework. Um, that um, paper with uh, Luke Anselm just came out last year. Um, so this is really, again, exploring some of the things I talked about at the beginning, where um, spatial interaction and heterogeneity between units at individual or group levels can violate counterfactual framework assumptions. And again, we need a spatial perspective to consider the spatial effects in the structure of the research design and then in, and assess that influence on assignment and the final treatment effect evaluation. Um, so here, using uh, two different experimental approaches, one is the classic aggregate uh, simple differences and differences ana analysis, and then second, a parametric um, DID analysis with and without spatial effects. So my apologies to all the non-parametric <laughs> researchers out there. Um, <laughs> 
So um, I also added this slide here because um, in case there are um, any, you know, big fans or um, not fans of <laughs> differences and differences approaches. Um, so technically this will be a weak quasi-experimental design, but it's going to be as good as we can get considering the data that's available. Um, so uh, to, you know, address parallel trends issues with DID design, well, um, in this analysis, we didn't have access to pre-2007 supermarket data, but the literature really supports kind of this persistent um, inequity between um, the groups that we're studying. Um, uh, to address issues of falsification, I added controls and a common trends interaction term for the panel um, to address composition of the sample as well as um, deal with things at the, like the long versus short run, um, really implemented a lot of exploratory spatial data analysis um, to, to really explore the data and the different dimensions um, directly. And so we have strict rules for pre post. Um, and uh, again, the common trends assumption or the, the common as well. Um, to deal with issues of functional form, uh, we've transformed the log uh, we've transformed um, the access metric to uh, a log to normalize access data and capture difference from the baseline. All right, so what are the measures? And again, the question, did the recession supply a shock uh, to at-risk areas overall, or did it magnify effects of segregated areas um, or, you know, non-segregated areas? Well, there are no non-segregated areas in Chicago. So uh, essentially that segregation ends up becoming pretty important um, that are characterized by the, the de-investment. So let's look at the measures. So how do I define the recession? Um, the change of season, seasonally adjusted real GDP from the third quarter of 2008 to the second quarter of 2009. So essentially um, assume, you know, stating that it occurs between the two cross sections that we have. Um, for demographic data, I pull population, race, ethnicity, by census tract for pre and post recession periods. So for the pre recession proxy, I use this 20, 2000 census um, because that's the only um, data set that was available essentially um, that did not mix with the post recession, unfortunately. Um, and then the post recession proxy is the 2014 um, American Community Survey average, which is an average of 2009 to 2014. Um, and then further to identify areas as similar as possible, um, only census tracts with boundaries that did not change between 2000 and 2010 were used for the causal analysis. So we lose a little bit of data that way, but um, it was really important to keep as uh, because it's a weak design to begin with, we want to be as strict as possible to make the most of what we have. Um, to measure supermarkets, um, uh, this data came from work on the topic from previous studies. Um, we essentially have a chain we and have, independent. Oh, sorry, uh, we have a raised hand. Uh, uh, the person in, go ahead. Hey, hi, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Uh, just, just a little question, just one clarification. I'm trying to follow in, but what, what is the treatment exactly here in this, in this, in this model? Yes, I, that's going to be the next slide, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question, because here the treatment is actually a bad thing. This is a treatment you don't want. Um, it's going, the treatment is essentially the effect of the recession. Um, okay. <laughs> so let me know if you have questions when I get there. Um, so, okay. this, oh, please go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, I, I will wait for the next slide. Sure. All right. So, supermarket data. Um, I'll just summarize saying that it's high quality chain and independent stores um, for uh, from previous work, and then to measure the food access measure. And actually, I think that it's in two slides because first I define how I'm defining food access the treatment and then the actual, the study design. Um, so to measure food access, um, this is a cost distance measure. So for each year, I had calculated an average network distance to all uh, supermarkets along residential street networks in Chicago. Um, this was done 
by converting the street network into a grid map with a 10 foot resolution and then calculating the cost distance to all supermarkets for each pixel. The resulting measure was then averaged for each census tract as a raw cost distance and then adjusted for population as a cost distance rate. Um, so again, for this analysis, I use the log of the adjusted food access measure to transform the previously dis uh, skewed distribution to a normal one for statistical analysis. Um, so this is just gives you an idea of what how the food access metric is um, uh, visualized or distributed throughout the city. Areas with that are greener have better food access. Areas that are um, this kind of white light gr green have have worse food access. And then here, it's a very small difference between the two, um, but you can see that um, between the two periods. But to um, <laughs> that has this question, what's the treatment, right? This is the whole purpose. So how do we measure the impact of the Great Recession? So in the U.S., the really the one of the strongest um, uh, outcomes of the recession was uh, foreclosures. So home foreclosures, because there's this massive housing bubble, um, a lot of predatory uh, uh, lending that occurred um and kind of resulting collapse right so here um the treatment so we're trying to proxy the effect of the recession and and here we're going to do that by looking at foreclosure estimates um, and then developing an excess risk um, of that so here trying to remain conservative i calculate the excess risk of foreclosure as a pre-processing step tracks with more than two times excess risk of foreclosure are considered as treated while others are uh, not treated. I used the 2008 foreclosure estimates and this was calculated at the census tract level by HUD, was, which is the housing um, kind of department at a federal scale for the US. And um, the foreclosure estimates, uh, I, I don't have the details here, but it essentially includes a range. Um, it's a kind of a composite index of multiple um, indicators um, of, you know, things from predatory lending rates um, to act like actual um, foreclosures um, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, so next, um, I, I have notes here so I don't talk too much or <laughs> I don't go off on a tangent. So in an aggregated classic DID analysis, I will compare the baseline distance to the nearest supermarket before and after the recession. Uh, treated areas have excess risk of foreclosure, control areas do not. So, um, so if I just compare treated all, control all, that's um, the control is again areas that are not impacted by the recession at the same, at the same rate. Um, and I add group effects um, and the group effects here are uh, segregation. Um, so uh, areas with black majority versus black minority groups. Um, and, and that is here. So here, uh, okay. I won't talk too much <laughs> about uh, the, um, some of the re results just yet. Let me pull this here. So what we see here on the right hand side is the raw distance measure. Um, and this is in um, just in miles. Uh, but you can see already that there are, it's, it's really important in DID to make sure that groups are, um, you know, we're not mixing groups if they have very different trends. And we can see that there are really distinct trends here, right? So in black majority groups, both the treatment and control both have to access um, or travel much further, whereas non, um, non uh, or black minority groups, which traditionally have much higher investment um, from the business environment, um, have like just overall, the numbers are quite different. Okay, and here. Okay. All right, so here, let me just pull this up so that I'm. <laughs> All right, so in the parametric uh, DID analysis, I run the analysis at the census tract level with and without spatial effects, and then include controls for different racial and ethnic groups. Um, I also consider time effects and common trends. Uh, uh, common trends interaction. Um, so I can come back to this later if folks have questions, but um, uh, essentially we have this uh, spatially lagged variable that's being instrumented on spatial lags of all other covariates. We're not using um, MML in this case. I believe I used um, uh, GMN um, for that estimation. 
All right, so thus the traditional approach considers group and temporal effects only. That's the simple DID analysis that's done at the aggregate level um, that's comparing overall effects for the whole city. But then um, the parametric approaches at the census track level using um, essentially spatial econometrics um, for many of these aspects um, give us a little bit more um, possibility for differences, right? So I also implement fixed and random effect models, extending them with spatial panel econometric approaches. And the random effect model, individual effects for each tract are characterized as random. Um, so there is that. All right, so in the aggregate DIG results, um, so tracts and treatment areas had significantly worse food access than those in control groups. So you already saw some of that in the, the, the table that I showed you. However, there was no significant change in either direction after the recession. So this, at the aggregate level, it was really clear that these are group, group differences, but the recession um, itself, or as a you know, quote unquote treatment, did not make the effect. Um, OLS, OLS um, uh, model group effects estimated an effect, but it was not significant. Um, and then there were also some interesting kind of decomposition of what was happening at a very small scale. So for example, black majority tracks with excess risk of foreclosure had no significant change over time. So they were deinvested um, and had minimal access at the very beginning and that just persisted over time. Marinia, uh, uh, sure. we have another question by Andres. Andres? Hi, Marinia. Um, sorry, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about the context. So these, these, these people, how, how do you know they are not moving between neighborhoods or between... Uh, so they can be changing from, the, from those treatment to control, I don't know. Yes. Yes. yes, so because there's no way to be 100% certain because we don't have individual data, we just have aggregate data. Um, again, there is just a, again, part of this is there is a limitation that that exists, that individuals are moving between areas. Um, but here, one of the issues is that we were looking at areas that had black uh, or, or like black or a majority or minority, like that the, the neighborhood composition stayed, um, we, captured, we captured some of that essentially. So we had neighborhood uh, composition at both time periods. Um, and some of the results here, we'll kind of discuss some of that as well. Um, and areas, neighborhoods that changed a lot, that had, that the population changed completely um, those those tracks were removed. So um, the census track boundaries, uh, when there's a massive amount of neighborhood change, the census track boundaries will actually change between time periods. And that did happen between this time period. So those tracks were removed from the analysis to try to keep it as equal. So again, it's it's impossible to 100% to, to correct for this. Um, but from from the data, at least, it um, there's relative um, stability at this local level at the neighborhood composition um, side. But again, I think that's the tricky part is that we're really looking at like not individual level effects, but these aggregate effects, but the great question. And if, yeah, <laughs> there's an idea as to how to address this further, um, it, it remains a, a challenge in this, this line of work. Thank you. Um, but here, so to answer, so to give you some examples, yeah, so, so for example, there were seven tracks that became black majority. Um, three had both worst food access and lost population. Okay, so since, so this is part, in part to, so your question here, right? So there were a few census tracks that, shi that shifted. Um, and so if they became black majorities, um, at least three of them had worse food access and, and lost population. We don't see that effect significant enough at a macro level, but locally that did happen. 84 census tracts became white majority areas and then over 70, so the great majority of those lost population. But what was really fascinating here is that even with a, a population decline, 18% of the tracts that became white majority and lost population saw better food access. All right, and from a market perspective, there's no explanation for that. Because um, if you have a losing population, there's um, like traditionally that's, um, at least that's, that's used often as the kind of justification here, right? 
Um, so, and then finally, uh, black minority tracks that were not at risk of um, foreclosure had a significant change post recession. Um, food access improved by 0.05 miles. So it's interesting here too, because I think traditionally we'll look at um, areas that are underserved and focus on changes there. This analysis is really starting to shift at looking at areas of privilege and areas that are doing very well. And these seem to be not only potentially, um, you know, protected by some of the impacts of these, um, you know, shocks, but actually um, they are increasing in their, um, in, in the access to infrastructure and services. So um, the parametric results uh, of the sensitivity analysis were really interesting. Uh, group effects persist and are sensitive to spatial specification. So here the spatial lag, I mean, just comparing the coefficients, you can see the spatial lag um, is, is a pretty significant um, player here, meaning that there is significant spatial patterns in the data. Um, black majority tracks are consistently linked with worse access. Hispanic majority tracks linked with better access. Um, I should note here, there's a lot of independent groceries um, uh, within his, uh, Hispanic majority census tracks in Chicago. So that's in one part theorized um, to one of the reasons that the access is better. And then white census tracks were not significant. Um, adding a special effect, however, and the special, the spatial lag is accounting for essentially some of these uh, wider segregation patterns that are occurring. Um, once you account for that explicitly, it, it reduces the impacts of all of these. So it's not necessarily individual racial ethnic groups, but it's the um, these wider segregation patterns. Um, and again, that is really showing the underlying patterns in Chicago may be more important than a single race um, or ethnicity. Okay, so how do we <laughs> kind of start to interpret all of this? So overall, um, segregated lower income Chicago neighborhoods with higher risk of foreclosure experienced a small but significant worsening in food accessibility after the Great Recession. Um, and I should note here that uh, a lot of times when spatial effects are introduced to kind of counterinfectual um, frameworks, the actual effect size may not be that much larger. However, there is an increased understanding of what's happening. So, um, so I think that's, it's almost like a tuning, tuning of an instrument um, in so many ways. Um, so here, just based on the results, it, that really seems to kind of, um, con uh, yeah, address <laughs> a compounding crisis of both economic vulnerability and structural racism. And structural racism that's occurring at this, again, more macro perspective. Um, when spatial effects are accounted for explicitly within a modeling framework, black majority areas no longer predicted low food accessibility. And that's really that spatial model. Um, the, I think it was a fixed effect spatial lag specification. Um, instead, areas of lower income and more foreclosures experienced worsened supermarket access. And so here, like another way of looking at this is the spatial pattern of food access mimics the spatial pattern of foreclosure and residential segregation. And this is, again, why uh, it's very difficult to tease these apart in traditional analyses because the spatial patterns are so similar across each of them. So we really need um, to, to find better ways to, um, to decompose that. And um, so this work or this finding is in line with a lot of other research, like what a lot of other researchers have been noting. Um, so, uh, to think about the kind of mechanisms for why this might have occurred. Um, there's a lot of research showing that minority neighborhoods, so in this case, black majority neighborhoods, were actually targeted for predatory loans in the Great Recession. Um, and there's potential complications of this too. So wealthier and gentrifying Ameri or African American communities experience generally worst, but may kind of mixed impacts from the recession. Um, but in Chicago, there's a neighborhood, Bronzeville, that, um, you know, was wealthier and gentrifying. Um, but following the recession, there was, again, this severe and prolonged property decline. Um, so there's concern here that the, there's longer lasting effects of the recession beyond just grocery store access, right? So minority applicants face higher probability of loan denials and high, higher foreclosure minority neighborhoods in the post-recession period. Um, and then 
as a health geographer, I'm also really interested in how this connects to health outcomes. And that's, that's another project that um, we're wrapping up right now. Um, but neighborhood foreclosures have also been associated with anxiety, stress, insecurity, uncertainty. Um, and then when tied to food insecurity, a lot of research shows dispar disproportionate impacts on women. And I'll give you just kind of a, a flavor. Um, so another project we are wrapping up now in Chicago, looking at foreclosure as a um, as an independent kind of uh, marker of, uh, or as an additional covariate, um, found that that was uh, very strongly tied to hypertension rates um, in, in the South Side, which is a pr predominantly um, Black population, which, um, again, like those are two very different, you think that they'd be two very different phenomena, um, but it seems like there are these really close impacts um, that can be uh, observed at these neighborhood levels. Um, okay, so <laughs> I, I never liked this slide, um, but I'm, <laughs> my, my mentors always tell me to include it. Um, so yes, so this, this work um, did some, it tried its best <laughs> to kind of link wider trends of deinvestment and community factors. Um, and here, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the common thread is that we can, it's important to have a multidimensional lens um, when, when looking at these really complex factors and um, and again, instead of representing neighborhoods as just like one uh, ethnicity or another, looking at it from a more complex perspective. Um, so the shock of the recession may have magnified effects of segregated vulnerable areas that were characterized by deinvestment. Um, and again, one of the, the big takeaways here is, and I, I, I'm exciting to, it's exciting to be around the, um, I don't know if I, <laughs> I mean, even, even with the pandemic happening, um, it's exciting to be around right now because there is a lot of really exciting work happening in causal analysis and kind of um, uh, working between uh, different traditions of causal analysis and um, in doing things like, you know, expanding how spatial effects might be integrated within that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and I guess we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you, Marinia. Uh, I think I'm gonna start opening the questions uh, with, uh, so in your, in your slide for the employee, spatial lag impact, the spatial lag regression, my first question is uh, why not try to do an impact analysis approach? Uh, well, 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 where you could have uh, one of the advantages from the spatial model is to have the direct and indirect effects uh, from these uh, variables into the into the into your dependent variable. Uh, and how would it be more uh, approached when using the treatment and the treatment and the treatment uh, different approach? So uh, we have seen it in the normal in the normal spatial regression model, the SAR, the, the Durbin model. But uh, would it change in, when approaching it in the treatment in the different different spatial approach or not? And um, should it uh, provide more um, complex results? Uh, would be my first uh, consideration. My second consideration is uh, well. I really, I have really liked the Delgado and Florax 2016 paper where they have the spatial, the ATE and the spatial neighboring ATE, how do they can define for the total effect. Uh, but again, they have, a, they have a different approach to create, how they create the weight matrix, which is the weight matrix only serves to uh, isolate the effect of those neighboring, uh, neighbors, neighbors of the treated and not for everyone else. So yeah. should uh, this provide a different uh, result from the one you found? And how come that they can, be? would it be an improvement or just a similar result would be my first question there. And that, that those are my two questions. Yeah, no, I think these are great. And I think that, I mean, in so many ways, cause I, I had, I had a limit. So I did a, a 
kind of a series of different, mm -hmm. you know, models to kind of compare different approaches. Part of this was more modeled off of um, a, like longitudinal, you know, DID panel analysis. Um, Ingress and Pischke have a really great book, Mastering Metrics, <laughs> of um, just different, uh, more like textbook ways of approaching these um, these considerations. So it, in some ways, part of part of the approach here was modeled more on that from like the longitudinal panel analysis perspective. And, and, it's, and it's, it's really meant just to be kind of a start. I think here the data, there's, there's too many limitations with the data and like I just like mentioned some of these issues already where I didn't want to like push the data to do more than it could <laughs> and, and just look for um, consistency across multiple different model, um, models. So I, 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 from all of this, I, oh, there's so many strong effects throughout of certain trends that I would, I would hypothesize that, I mean, A, I think it'd be great to, to, to do even more like different types of modeling approaches, like, like the, the ones that you've talked about. I would hypothesize that the results would probably be, the, like the, the trends are so consistent, um, whether you look at it from an exploratory perspective or um, all, all these other um, kind of specific, you know, different different versions a lot of the the trends kind of move in the same direction so maybe it might refine you know coefficients or standard errors are a little bit more but because again because of the limitations of the data itself and the design itself i'd be i'd be nervous to say that it's more precise right so there's like this trade off of precision and um and overall impact but i think that um I think that it's such an important direction that we need to all kind of go in is to explore these different approaches because there's a lot of really phenomenal work in spatial econometrics from like a theoretical perspective or you know like just having a lot of different uh, models uh, just yeah having different taxonomies of models but um, having them having these uh, used to translate like in, a, in applied settings that can be easily digestible by um, <laughs> by policy audiences um, is yeah so so there's a trade-off for sure um, but yeah I, I yeah I, at least in the in in at least one of the uh, models it wouldn't be that much more difficult to decompose into the direct and indirect effects um, so that yeah I don't know if that answers the question but kind of, kind of, I guess it's like yeah I had to stop the analysis at some point but <laughs> I agree that there's a lot more that could be done well, there, there will be there. There can be further research to do. <laughs> uh, any more questions, comments? Uh, Juan, I have yes. a question. Um, uh, sorry, Marini, I I got an interruption of a urgent phone call from the university, but I hope I could get like to pick up this more important thing you said. Um, you said that you don't have individual data, so you, you can do things like, for instance, uh, check also the difference when uh, like people living in, in certain neighborhood have lived uh, longer in that neighborhood. Yeah, because you don't have individual, right? But you, you maybe could do other interesting things, not for this paper, of course, but I, I'm thinking like, like uh, interesting research that uh, someone or you yourself can do uh, afterwards with this, um, uh, like using, you know, the same framework that you have used, because like, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, for instance, I don't know uh, if it's available, but I guess uh, public, public spending at the level of uh, each neighborhood and see uh, how this changes the results. Like I saw that you, that you use race as a, an important variable to differ the, to make difference uh, like heterogeneity, to detect heterogeneity. But you think that these other variables and which other variables you think at the level of neighborhood uh, can, can be interesting to, to, like, to continue with this uh, research agenda that you, that you have? Yeah, no, that's, these are all great points. So again, like, well, I mean, part of this too is like, even if we, I'm, I'm trying to advocate so that even if we don't have perfect data or the perfect, you know, experiment possible, we can still make some insights. So, um, so I had tried to, again, try to make neighborhoods at least equal. So really f capture neighborhood composition before and after so that we can m mitigate some of that. 
um, only using neighborhoods that didn't change dramatically between time periods, because that, again, a different uh, influence could drive the results that we see. But, um, but yeah, I think that there's a lot more, there's a lot more that could be done. So, I, you know, yeah, incorporating things like um, income, that was also um, included at the, at the neighborhood scale. Um, but it's difficult because a lot of times, like a lot of the variables start to be very, like just different iterations of each other, right? Um, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so this is an area that we're continuing to work in. Um, I had mentioned that there's another project I'm working on um, that, looks at for that looks at hypertension rates um, on the south side of Chicago, and that is being done at the, we have individual level data, but then we're aggregating it to the census track just to look for similar kind of patterns. And it was so interesting that, um, foreclosure was, uh, more, uh, impactful, um, covariate than anything else. And in this model, we're including probably like 15 different socioeconomic, uh, variables or other things. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I still am, I think finding the kind of perfect suite of variables is, is really important. And at this more micro level, well, I mean, it's not individual level. At the neighborhood level, getting spending is not possible um, because of, at least here, like that, um, that data is just not, it's only available at the county level, um, in, which is much larger. So it's this kind of conundrum, like what can we do with data that's at a more at the level that's closer to the data generating process, but we don't have perfect data for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk more about this too um, in the future. So um, it's like the, the holy grail of, of what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marina, thanks uh, for sharing your work with us. Did you just close the slides? Thanks. Yep, so that. Got it. Thank you. Uh, any more comments, questions? And I should note something that we've been also thinking about is adding the subsidy data. So what, which, um, no. which census tracts were flagged as being eligible for subsidies, even mm -hmm. if we weren't able to get, even if we can't actually get whether or not they became um, subsidized. So that's another kind of dimension we're looking at. It, it, everything ends up being an indirect path, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. And define geography. It's, it's, it's an issue also for privacy stuff and that, yeah. that kind of information. Um, and I don't think we have any. Let's do a last call for questions. Let me, let me ask another thing. Yes. Marinia, thank you so much. Very nice presentation. Really enjoy it. Uh, this, this question is a little bit more, well, it's actually two questions um, related with the model. So the, the first one, the first question is, uh, is there any preference, like you were talking about the skewiness of your, of your data, and I see you take, you take the logs. Is there any preference why you took the logs instead of doing any other like Poisson regressions mm -hmm. or or something like that. Um, and my second question is, you were, I, I think in one part you say that you could not like test a uh, parallel trends assumptions. And I guess that's what you are following the, the models in the PSK, in the mastering metrics, right? Because you control for all those fixed effects. Um, but, but in that case, I think something you can do is do placebo regressions. Um, and just that, that will like, strain your argument that there is not any noise or any dissimilar group in your estimates. Um, mm. Yeah, those are my, my, my two questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I think for the first piece, it's the log transformation. It, so especially the food access, like the distance measures are really difficult um, because they're always really skewed. So for the food distance measure, um, yeah, I think transforming it to the log was just um, preference. I know that there's, um, maybe it's just to be different for my colleagues who use Poisson regressions for everything. No, um, I don't know. But I, I think that, again, I would hypothesize that the results would not be dramatically different because the, the, the patterns are so strong. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, yeah, there's, 
there's a lot more to be kind of uncovered as well within the non non parametric approach. Um, so, so I guess for me, it's more of a to be determined <laughs> future work um, kind of perspective, but would love to talk about it um, for future work as well. Okay, Marinia, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you I'm going to stop recording.